Hi, I'm Stanley. With uh, I'm live here with uh, Hexagon Live in Las Vegas. I'm going to start off with a video that's about 40 seconds long of an incident in upstate New York in 2014. Uh, there's two drivers involved in this incident. Uh, Tony Stewart and Kevin Ward that we'll be talking through um, as, as we work through this presentation and, and talk about photogrammetry and uh, lens distortion and uh, match moving. We'll pause there for a sec. So that, pre that presentation that I was just showing you, or that video that I was just showing you, this is a press release from the uh, district attorney's office in 2014. This is uh, cited by Auto Week. Um, the district attorney says that uh, videos do not show Tony Stewart driving recklessly in the fatal accident. It goes on to say that while the process was long and emotionally difficult, it allowed for all the facts of the accident to be identified and known. What I want to challenge you with is when the digital evidence is constrained to a point cloud, previously hidden information is now discoverable. We'll work our way through that and I'll show you why. So in today's age, digital evidence is everywhere. We have cell, phone, uh, cell phones collecting uh, photographs and videos, they've even got their own GPS on them, uh, surveillance cameras, drones, GPS, uh, scene photographs from law enforcement, dash cameras, body-worn cameras, video doorbells, uh, traffic cameras, and uh, even uh, uh, vehicle event data recorders, um, or the black boxes that we can pull down off of vehicles. So as we talk through this hidden, hidden information that is uh, now discoverable through this process, there's three things that I'm going to cover. There's lens distortion, photogrammetry and videogrammetry, and match moving or camera matching. So we'll start with lens distortion, and we'll talk a little bit about how that lens distortion is, what that lens distortion is. So lens distortion is the curvature of the lens of any camera or video camera. And you know, certain cameras have uh, various lens uh, curvature to them that's known. Other cameras we don't necessarily know, uh, and we've got to figure it out and, and pull that out. But what it's going to do is that lens distortion creates a fisheye or a barrel distortion, as shown in this photograph. I'll walk through a couple of cases that we've worked on, and, and as I progress through these cases, I'll show how the lens distortion and then the, the subsequent topics uh, it was applied to these situations. So this first one, I always ask, well, how tall is this guy? I'm guessing that you don't think he's seven foot. I would guess that you don't even think that he's six foot. Let's uh, remove that fisheye lens from this. And this also has a little bit of photogrammetry to it. But the gentleman in the, on the left, his height is actually six foot four. So when you correct for that, you can see that that um, makes a drastic difference in, in what is perceived in this photograph. In this instance, we were actually concerned about, we were tasked with figuring out exactly where this rifle was pointed at this point in time. And so went through the process, first thing was lens distortion and remove that. When you go through that lens distortion, you actually see that the staircase is now, or when you correct for lens distortion, you actually see that the staircase uh, is, is now viewable uh, on the right side of the photograph. I'll take you through case two. In here you can see the, the red lines and the blue lines, red lines horizontal, blue lines vertical, and you can see the distortion of this scene. This was taken from a dash cam of a, of a police cruiser as we walked up to, as they drove up to an incident. When we show you the post uh, lens distortion and correction, um, you can see that uh, the gentleman in the center of that photograph does appear to be further away. That can, be, that can have an impact on your investigation and what you're, what you're trying to find and present when you're trying to present it accurately. It can also have an impact on how 
the, the images are, are pulled into the point clouds, which we'll get into here in a minute. So that's lens distortion. Um, let's move into photogrammetry and videogrammetry. So photogrammetry, videogrammetry is the, is the, it's the scientific uh, measurement or the, the science of attaining accurate measurements from photographs or videos. Concept dates back to at least uh, Da Vinci when he was referencing it in 1480. All things uh, transmit th their transmit through image of the eye by pyramidal lines. Uh, that's the lines that come in as you, as you as you think about perception away from you. Uh, there there's uh, there's angles that come into your eye. Uh, once those so we want to correct for those, and or we want to understand that and then um, and use that to our advantage today with. With point clouds, um, a lot of this is 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 being done in the background, but uh, it's it's based on science. So once the videos, photos, and videos are accurate, then they can be tied to a point cloud, which is ultimately where we're headed. Does anybody recognize this? It's Dealey Plaza uh, down in Dallas, Texas. It's where JFK was shot in uh, 1963. Obviously, photogrammetry was used in that incident to recreate and understand. The, uh, the, the shooter's location and even evaluate the multiple shooter theories and so forth that exist. So that's photogrammetry. Let's move into match moving and camera matching and how the hidden becomes discoverable. So back to case one. In this situation, camera matching is, is, is establishing two-dimensional points in a that can be seen in a video or which is just a framework it's multiple frames of a, a to, uh, multiple single camera pictures of a, of a frame that are um, linked and so we're, tr we're trying to create two dimensional select two dimensional points that are identifiable in both the video and the point cloud and this is the process of where we're going through and in, in, in doing that so in this case, as I mentioned, we wanted to know where that firearm was specifically pointed. We were provided with um, about 12 to 15 seconds of surveillance camera footage, uh, and this was the most uh, relevant still frame that we've presented here. And then we went in after the fact and generated a point cloud uh, and scanned both the interior of this residence as well as the exterior. Um, when we put all of that to together, and we've established where that firearm is pointed, and now we constrain that to the point cloud. And you can see on the right side here, the photographs that show the additional point cloud data that was down, uh, downrange from, from the backyard of this residence. You can see that the firearm is pointed you know, in, in this area, which in this specific case was not where the placards one, two, three, and four, the yellow placards are located in the bottom right there. Um, particularly important and, and had huge implications on, on the outcome of this trial. Ultimately, that was the result of constraining that video and that single frame to the point clouding and finding the specific alignment uh, of that rifle. Let's talk through a second second situation, case two. Case two is a domestic dispute that res uh, police were responding to. And we were provided with two body cams for the, from the officers and one dash camera. We were also provided with, or we obtained a point cloud subsequent to the event uh, where we aligned and matched these, um, matched all of this information up. So you can see before I jump into the video uh, that, that sequences all of the uh, all of the videos, the dash cams and the body cams, or bo body cams and the dash cam. You can see the the correction that we've already done on the camera. You can also see on this dash cam as this cruiser pulls in. You can also see how the camera is. Uh, I'm sorry. How you can see beyond the extents of what was in view of that dash cam. You're not going to see, obviously, you're not going to see any moving people or anything that's outside of that that was not collected as data. But you can put this into context and move this camera through the scene, through the point cloud scene, and, and, and understand exactly. You can understand more information beyond the, the extents of the camera. 
So these are the three videos that we were provided with, synced up in time, to watch this instance. I'll let this roll here a little bit. But ultimately, these officers come in and out of screen as they move towards the individual that was involved in this incident. Here's the dash cam rolling in, and we've got it integrated into the point cloud. Now, this is what the officer's seen on the dash cam, and we can also see the outside of that. So we have, we have knowledge of, okay, there's vehicles on the side of us, there's a building to the right. We understand a little bit more context of what the involved, officers uh, involved in this situation experienced. And this is just a, a graphic of us showing a camera as it, as it moves through, through space. And, and then an, overall, an overhead aerial of where these officers are um, once, um, once the point cloud has been generated. What's really interesting about this is once you've got the scene developed, then you can place the camera in, in any location to evaluate you know, the circumstances of the incident. So you can understand from an aerial perspective or from a side perspective or an officer's perspective what they may have seen, or even from the victim's uh, perspective in this situation. So this is case number three. This is the race that, was, that I led with in the video that you see in the beginning. We did a scan of the, of the racetrack and uh, you know, multiple scans um, using the Leica. Uh, this is the RTC 360, I believe, that was used on this case and the, um, uh, yeah, and, and to develop that scan. These, this vehicle here is an exemplar vehicle that, was, that we had a scan of, and this is just us showing some, uh, the photogrammetry that we were doing on it, the, match, the uh, camera matching, and then placing that camera, or placing that vehicle into the scene of the incident. So, or into the, you know, this, this Leica scan data. So from behind, now we're correlating the location of that vehicle into the point cloud from the camera that, that observed this incident. And then we can start to do the match, match um, uh, camera matching on the entire incident. So each of those little, black, each of those little green and pink uh, squares are points that have been identified in both the video and the point cloud so that we can align everything and run this through the software and process to figure out exactly where, what took place in this incident. In this case, what was of most note and uh, question was, what is the depth of these vehicles? Where are they in relationship to, to, the, to the viewer, to this camera? And so once those are put into a point cloud, um, and, and calibrated, now we can see an aerial view of how all of these vehicles moved relative, you know, from an aerial perspective rather than a long perspective looking down. And you might have a little bit of a different perspective on, on the findings of that case after looking down on this. So as we, as we discussed earlier, you can also, once these point clouds are developed and you've got everything scientifically ac uh, you know, accurate and lined up, now you can move in and you can present this from, from the perspective that you'd like to present it from. So that was a perspective from Kevin Ward and what he would have seen as the vehicle uh, moved towards him. We can look at it from behind, we can look at it from anywhere, but this is the perspective from down low on the track from behind to see how the movement happened and, and you know, even the relationship to the blue car that went through before the red car. So the findings of the case were ultimately that uh, Stewart's vehicle's speed, acceleration, angle, and path differed from all of the others. Uh, prior to impact, Stewart applied his throttle, causing his car to drift up the track. There are many other findings that we came to, but these were the key ones and that, that, that I wanted to present today. So if we circle back to the original DA's opinion on this, you know, he stated, while the process was long and emotionally difficult, under, fully understandable, it allowed for all of the facts to have been, be identified and known. Um, camera matching, at least if it was, 
it should have been available at that time. We did it shortly thereafter. Uh, uh, camera matching the point clouds provides additional clarity on all of the facts. So in hindsight, would the, hi would the headline change if, if the DA had this opinion and the investigative team had this, had this information to evaluate their, their um, uh, to evaluate the case? There's the documentary that's an 80 or 90 minute documentary that was generated that goes through the entire process. There's a lot of interviews of how we did the, the actual uh, uh, aggregation of the data, the point clouds, the camera matching and everything that's been turned into. Um, it's not, a, we're not associated with it. It's just a documentary that they've, that they've generated. So I've covered how the hidden how the hidden um, becomes discoverable uh, and, and the tools that we've used to get there. So lens distortion, uh, correcting for it, photogrammetry and videogrammetry, how that's behind everything that we do. The camera matching, which is taking this to, taking point clouds to the next level and, and, and being able to analyze scientifically and accurately the, the video footage now that we can tie them to uh, um, you know, physical tangible points in space. So I'll leave you with this. When digital evidence is constrained to a point cloud, previously hidden information is now discoverable. And I think that's the key point that I want to make sure that we get across today. So thank you for your time.